Hi, this is Pat Morehead with More Insights and Strategy, and we are here for another awesome 6-5 podcast. It's Friday. Uh, Daniel has repapered his room uh, back there with frogs or something. It looks like a combination of a cityscape and Fish. an octopus. Octopi. So, Daniel, where where are you? Did you did you read? I'm in an undisclosed bunker, and this sweater I'm wearing is a twenty two thousand dollar cashmere sweater. I knew that. I knew it. You and Shamath. Uh, yeah, I knew there that, was something. Dang, about you I didn't guys. know you were going to give the reference away. I decided going forward, we need to be in undisclosed bunkers in different parts of the world because it makes us seem more interesting than just being like I'm in Europe or I'm in North America. You know what I mean? So I'm going to just say undisclosed bunker close to where MWC 22 <laughs> is going to be held next week. So that's good. But, that's good. So the land of wine, cheese and come ham. On. Come on. Come on. Okay. Uh, so anyways, uh, yes, here, can you catch a Barcelona game, uh, which is uh, Sunday. So that's exciting. I but, love uh, it. Yeah. So, yeah. so we're, we're back, buddy. And yeah, uh, I know we're back. And if it's the first time that uh, you have hit the pod, uh, we cover six topics for around five minutes each, sometimes 10 minutes each, depending on uh, how much you want to talk and how much energy we have and how good the topic is. We don't talk a lot about the news. It's really about the analysis and the and the who cares. Uh, I also want to make a reminder, uh, we are going to talk about some earnings and public companies. So please don't take anything that we say as investment advice. Find a professional because this is for entertainment and informational purposes only. Uh, we have a great show here. We're talking about a bunch of stuff. We're talking MWC, Dell, Qualcomm, Rakuten, T-Mobile, Lenovo, and a lot more. So let's dive in. Uh, Daniel, I'm going to be in the undisclosed city uh, on Sunday morning. Uh, you beat me there. You're going to have a fun weekend there, but let's jump in. So Daniel, uh, what should we expect from MWC 22? Yeah, I think this is a, first of all, a good pivotal moment. We've gone through these ebbs and flows over the last 12 months, but really in the last three months, where we've effectively seen the world's largest tech events sort of in this state of limbo. And, and yeah. Pat, we both went to CES. It was not even close to normal. It was oddly quiet. Um, yet, again, we found some joy in the fact that for those companies that were there, we were able as analysts to get so much access and talk to the, so many people, have some really great quality conversations. But it just wasn't the same. And then I actually went to NRF, which is the big show in New York, the retail technology show, kind of the same thing, only a few thousand attendees compared to, I think it was like, you know, less than a quarter of normal. Well, they're saying, Pat, they're going to get about 50,000 people are going to be coming to Barcelona, which to me is an indicator that we are getting into those very late innings, which it's felt like for about a year we were, but of this COVID and the impact. And I think there's a couple factors in play. And I'll talk about this for a second. Then I'll talk a little bit about the technology at the, sh at the show. But I think the, the factors in play is one, the events industry has probably been one of the most ravished of any industry on the um on the planet. I mean, just talk about stops and starts. CES, they were going to go in 21, then they didn't. I mean, these shows are economies. Barcelona here depends on hundreds of thousands of people coming into the city and eating and drinking and staying in hotels and having events and taxi cabs and, and hotels. And I, I think the devastation of the economy has started to weigh where some of these events are like, look, we can do this safe. Now that people have been vaccine, 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 vaccinated, now that we have more protocols, you know, if you want to wear masks, if you want to have to carry a digital IDs, you, you do certain, you know, uh, you can test rapidly and know whether you are or aren't. Not perfect, Pat, but it is, uh, you know, it's come a long way. And I think events with the right protocols are able to be held. And so I think they're full on now. And, and by the way, you know, we've been flying on airplanes now for the better part of a year, year and a half. And yes, I understand we wear we wear masks, but I mean, you're sitting like six inches from people in these spaces. At least they can ventilate them. You can keep some distance from people. And even if they're crowded, it's not nearly as on top of people as like <laughs> as we are on airplanes. Um, you know, in terms of technology, Pat, you know, over the last, I think, three or four years, it's felt like every year is going to be the year 5G. 
this is the year of 5G. Well, <laughs> I would say that during the pandemic, when there was no Mobile World Congress, was probably the most legitimate year of 5G. Um, you know, we saw massive adoption of handsets, of infrastructure deployments. Um, you know, the most recent release, uh, you know, we're seeing uh, numbers from companies like Qualcomm explode. We're seeing handset numbers. We're also seeing the infrastructure companies rolling out new, new technologies around 5G. And I think that will once again be in focus here at MWC. I think automotive has become a focal point of every show. And every time uh, I go to a show now, whether it's consumer, whether it's retail, whether it's uh, you know now a mobile world, which is more enterprise and, and tel telco and, and network, more more automotive. I will not be surprised to see a significant uh, rise in announcements and um, participation, either partnerships or actual via, man, uh, OEMs and manufacturers there talking about their wares. 5G will fundamentally change um, mobility. And by the way, you don't need 5G to do it. We've been doing uh, cloud to vehicle for some time with 4G and LTE, but 5G will make it better, more reliable, and it will take us to the next level. So I'll pause there because I said a lot, but I think there's still a lot you know, of directions for you to take this. Oh, I appreciate it. And and the great thing about uh, having a huge show like MWC, it's going to be hard to suck all the oxygen uh, out of the room on the analysis. And, and you know, I've been pre-briefed, so we need to kind of watch what watch what we say and generalize. I think the, the good news is, is, is later on in the show, we're going to talk about some early, early announcements, right? Yeah. And I think what we're doing is, is, is 5G is maturing, right? Started off uh, with uh, uh, low band in the US, it was low band and millimeter wave. And there was this big gap in the center. And uh, between, uh, between uh, C band and what came with Sprint on the mid band, at least the United States, we're seeing that um, <clears throat> to really, really connect the dots. And, and quite frankly, uh, and, and I had a, I had a great conversation a couple months back with the CEO of uh, Ericsson, uh, talking about you know what is it going to take to 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 have the new applications of five G, and I think where we both landed up landed is is it that you had to have um, no. top to bottom five G capabilities to get the developers excited and. I think we are at this point, so I think you you add a couple years uh, to this, and hopefully we'll see some novel things come out of of five G. And and um, not that there hasn't been a lot of goodness, but at least on the smartphone side, it's it's essentially been faster, you know, faster downloads and not really new way of doing things like we saw in the transition from from three G to to four G. But I am very very optimistic. Uh, I think we can also expect uh, a bunch of smartphones. Um, uh, Samsung actually went very, they changed their strategy, right? They came out early uh, with the S22 uh, line, um, which I think disappointed some people at MWC. But you know, quite frankly, Samsung's a company that's big enough that uh, they can take all the oxygen in the smartphone uh, room. And they're either the number one or number two. Uh, vendor, depending on what uh, on what quarter that you look at, but I think we'll see a lot of other uh, smartphone makers. Uh, whether um, uh, it's it's folks like Oppo, um, a lot of folks out of China, uh, and some of the indigenous uh, makers, even out of out of out of Latin America, and I think it's really going to be bigger, better, faster, uh, bigger, better, faster, uh, uh, cheaper, and. Uh, that's that's certainly not as exciting as it as it used to be, uh, but I also think it's a it's an indication of the maturation of the uh, smartphone market. We're going to see a ton of ORAN. We're going to see a ton of VRAN. Right? We we're, we're in this massive architectural change. Uh, we we're seeing at the core where there used to be five different architectures, and now there's two, uh, and added virtualization and and containers. And now, uh, going farther out on the edge with uh, with VRAN and ORAN, you're seeing more industry standard uh, makers jump in. As and as you're going to see, uh, as we talk about HPE uh, and um, uh, and and Dell. Actually, we're not talking about what Dell's doing there, but um, they've made some pretty big announcements uh, as well with uh, with Marvell. So. Uh, I'm, I'm looking forward to it. Uh, I lost 100% of my hotel money two years ago uh, when they canceled it. I didn't get any of my money back. Uh, I'm looking at you, Nobu uh, Hotels. 
uh, that didn't give me my money back. So uh, if I get on that plane and uh, it doesn't look like it's going to cancel. In fact, I'd love to see uh, if they just cancel all the mask stuff. I mean, my gosh, uh, they're going to do it in the U.S. I think today. Right. Um, so uh, anyways, Daniel, some uh, really good uh, analysis here. Let me uh, let's change the topic here and get into some earnings action. Uh, we saw Dell um, deliver earnings uh, last night. And listen, the expectations uh, for them were were pretty, pretty darn big, because if you look at historically, they had beaten on the top line and the bottom line pretty substantially for the last uh, for the last four quarters. Uh, their stock is up 34 percent in the last in the past 12 months. So doing doing really well. And, and this is in the midst of, of them uh, spinning off VMware. Uh, this quarter, they beat on the top line and they missed uh, on EPS for, for various reasons, one of them uh, being a, a tax reason. And I was thinking to myself, OK, I guess that's the point that you fire you fire your uh, your tax accountants uh, in how uh, you did that, because, you know, their their stock. Uh, was at least last night getting uh, get getting uh, beaten up uh, 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 pretty big. So, really, some big highlights though. I and mean, my gosh, record PC revenue at twenty six percent gain, a thirty percent jump in commercial growth of PCs. And and Daniel, I I started in the PC market in nineteen ninety, and I have to tell you, uh, that's like the the nineties uh, decade uh, growth uh, there. Uh, I don't think we're going to sustain that, but I think we're going to have, I think as we, we heard from Intel last week, we're going to see pretty heavy uh, single digit uh, single digit growth uh, moving forward. Now, ASPs are going up, which uh, which makes it a huge difference. Well, in fact, market wise, ASPs went up 25 percent uh, in the U.S. Uh, last uh, quarter per uh, canalis. On the data center side, uh, revenue is up three percent, but... Uh, more importantly, bookings were up 17%. I was really glad to see that that uh, Dell typically doesn't talk about uh, demand or orders, uh, but I'm glad they did. Uh, essentially, uh, they are finally hitting up against some supply chain issues. Uh, they talked about um, uh, they talked about um, the the contamination uh, in. Well, they didn't name WD and Kioxia, but I will. Uh, there's a memory contamination issue that um, you know when you're selling a ton of of uh, of of flash uh, memory uh, and real memory, uh, the, these things uh, the, the, these things matter. Um, also on the on the data center side, um, uh, power store uh, while they didn't give um, and this is their their uh, new mid range uh, says their fastest ramp uh, in history. Uh, my final note is that for the year, they're a hundred billion dollar revenue company. And I think that's a a huge milestone, and and that does not include VMware. So, uh, uh, pretty awesome, and their investment grade uh, debt. So, uh, on on pretty good footing. Uh, it's disappointing that uh, that they missed um, on, on the EPS side. It would have made uh, for a great quarter. And it's, very rare that uh, you know Intel has. Sorry, that uh, Dell has some sort of a, quite frankly, a, a self uh, self inflicted uh, self inflicted wound related to taxes. Yeah, absolutely. Sometimes with these one off events, though, you have to sort of be able to write them off in your mind and kind of say, if we take this out, what did the numbers look like? And I think largely the numbers looked good. Um, you you did cover a lot of the critical numbers, but company did a really great job throughout the year with their client business. It was the anchor of growth, uh, being able to meet and exceed and, and uh, on all demand <laughs> when a lot of companies struggled. And we saw that over quarters past certain companies did not meet the demand. And so, you know, we've been hearing this backlog story from other companies, but hadn't really heard it from Dell very much because Dell had done such a good job. But, you know, like you said, there are some things that are completely out of control. And no matter how well you're managing your supply chain, these risks do come into play. Um, it's just another reason why our resiliency needs to be focused on. It's another reason we need to onshore more of our chip manufacturing back to the U.S. And, you know, we'll, we'll save that for a topic for another day. But um, it does impact bottom line when these things do creep up. 
Uh, I thought the dividend announcement was really good news. Part of that return to investor grade was a commitment to uh, you know pay a dividend. I think Dell really does fit in that sort of intermediary between value and growth. Um, their numbers have grown faster than some of their IT OEM counterparts. Um, again, this year, largely because of the PC business, but at the same time, being able to offer technology, innovation, growth, and a dividend um, is likely going to be attractive to investors that are looking for solid companies in the right markets that can offer a consistent return with a little less, um, you know, volatility in their share price, especially as we've seen what's happened to growth and, and what's going on. So this is very timely. I don't think it was timed with the market, but the dividend was very timely. And the last thing I'd say is that I'm watching closely to their service transformation. You know, the Apex business is still kind of in its infancy. You're starting to hear and see some wins getting announced. Um, but what we haven't heard and seen is, hey, how big is this business? And no doubt it's going to be a in the billions by the time we start seeing any sort of breakout. But with the market really wanting to understand, especially with VMware not there anymore, um, looking for where does that steady growth, where does that uh, net revenue expansion come from, and how are you switching more and more of your one-time CapEx type revenue to uh, consumption-based revenue. But uh, company's moving in the right direction. It was a good result. The miss was well, a miss on the EPS side, but the revenues were very good in the backlog should give confidence to anybody looking from afar that the next quarter should also be a solid result for the company. Yeah, I mean, it's a hugely disciplined company and I urge everybody to look at their their investor deck. I wish everybody had an investor deck, sorry, uh, our earnings deck uh, like Dell. Uh, they have an yeah. investment thesis slide, they have growth thesis, they have moats, uh, they have corporate strategy which uh, which I, I totally appreciate. So, Daniel, let's move to the next topic, uh, uh, very similar and uh, to, to what we were talking about trends at, at Mobile World Congress. And essentially, this is a Qualcomm and Rakuten partnering on on massive, massive, uh, massive MIMO. What, what's going on there? Yeah. So, Pat, you indicated the uh, that we'll be hearing quite a bit about Open RAN. Um, and right now, you know, what we're looking at are where are these kind of partnerships on a global scale? You know, you've got companies building technologies, you've got companies deploying technologies. And, you know, Rakuten announced a partnership. I actually had a chance to do a podcast with the uh, CEO of both Rakuten Symphony and Durga Milati from Qualcomm, who's that leads that business. And I mean, basically, it's a, you know, it's a 5G RAN platform. It's going to, uh, you know, be de designed and deployed by Rakuten. And they basically have picked Qualcomm to commercialize their massive MIMO, RUDU, and it's going to be what they're going to offer for their next generation 5G mobile infrastructure. So, you know, what we're really dealing with now, Pat, is you mentioned, you know, open and virtual RAN is is where they're going, right? The deployments of these uh, moving from old architectures to uh, cloud native architectures is the key. They want to be able to add automation. They want to be able to be more efficient. They want to be able to keep uptime levels high. And then, of course, they want to be cost effective. So, um, you know, this partnership, as they saw it, was going to give them the greatest opportunity to be successful. Of course, this adds to the diversification play of Qualcomm because, you know, so many people think of Qualcomm as the devices and handset side. But this is uh, this is heavy on the infrastructure side. This is where they are partnering up with companies. And by the way, Rakuten, Pat, I don't know if you remember around 2019 or 20, they had to have been the star of Mobile World Congress. I felt like every single booth I went to, I was yeah. seeing what Rakuten was doing with Cisco, what Rakuten was doing with Qualcomm, what Rakuten was doing with, you know, I, I think I saw nine demos <laughs> in 20, it must have been 19 the last time we were there. Um, but anyways, I digress. Uh, the fact of the matter is, is now, as I mentioned and you mentioned too, we're seeing a the year of 5G, and this is part of what's making it real. It's it's not just about having devices; it's about having the infrastructure that provides the the bandwidth, the capacity, the scale, and and by the way, the speed and efficiency that that these um, carriers need. So Rakuten's been consistently showing its flexing its muscle, um, especially overseas. I like them kind of like I like T-Mobile here in the U.S. in terms of, yeah. uh, you know, innovation. And it was a really, uh, you know, robust, solid partnership, Pat. Uh, you know, not a, I think this is one that we probably don't need to spend 20 minutes talking about, but uh, big win and obviously timely that they announced it coming right into MWC. Yeah, it, uh, it's funny. A couple of years back, uh, I used to 
I wouldn't say make fun of Rakuten, but it was like everybody was partnering with Rakuten, everybody in the industry, right? Uh, whether it was Intel, Qualcomm, um, you know, Marvell, it was like everybody was was partnering uh, with them. But 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 and they, but but in reality, they really are all kidding aside. They are really the poster child for the next generation of 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 a carrier, right? Um, where it's all virtualized. Uh, there's no cruff, meaning there's no uh, old legacy stuff that they have to take care of, or they need to capitalize. This is this is a, a brand new new infrastructure, and 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 like you said, most people look at Qualcomm uh, at, at their strengths, which is on the modem side, and uh, but they really have a growth play going, and and one of those is is infrastructure. If if you study the history of Qualcomm, uh, Qualcomm used to have infrastructure. They had infrastructure, and then they had uh, then they had phones. Um, so it, it was kind of ironic. Uh, that that they're getting back into the business, and nobody think nobody should think that they're that they're uh, brand they're brand new at this. That they're not. They're just getting they're just getting uh, they're just getting back into it. That's, and that's uh, such a good point, though, Pat. I, I'm not to, to cut you, but I was yeah. saying like, I was I was trying to say, and I, I think you just hit it in a few words. But is that people don't credit? But as we've talked about Qualcomm's diversification path, this is like one of those really good examples of how they are going to play in 5G well beyond their, their what they're best known for. Yeah, so you're right. We don't have to spend 20 minutes on this. This is uh, this is very uh, this is very straightforward. But um, it, you know, it's a positive sign for Qualcomm to see some success because, quite frankly, uh, you can't put a price on something. Right. Even if you give away something for free, uh, somebody's not going to take it unless it's really awesome. And it uh, looks like Qualcomm is is making it happen in yet another one of their growth businesses. So uh, let's move into a, a very uh, similar announcement. And that's a partnership between HPE and, and Qualcomm. Now, before I dive into this, I do want to mention that Dell Technologies and Marvell uh, had a, a very similar uh, type of partnership uh, between them, where where Dell was creating a a um, uh, an ORAN VRAN solution, uh, in, a, in that's very similar to this one between uh, HPE and and Qualcomm. But the nuts and the bolts of this uh, of this agreement is that um, um, that HPE is combining uh, one of their uh, racks uh, with a uh, Qualcomm uh, card. And uh, let me see if I can find the name, uh, the name of it, the Qualcomm X100 5G RAN accelerator card with a, an HPE ProLiant DL110 uh, telco server uh, uh, in there uh, in a very similar place. So, so hopefully when you think about Dell getting into this and HPE getting into this with silicon providers and card providers like Qualcomm and, and Marvell, you can see where this is going. Um, and I think you can see where this is going even more clearly if you look at what what the past was, and that was very proprietary RAN cards, uh, uh, primarily by by vendors like uh, Ericsson and Nokia and and Samsung, right? So uh, with HPE and Dell Tech uh, uh, coming in here, re really leading an ORAN, I think this is really good position for them, right? Dare I say the word? It's a little bit more commoditized of a market and that's where uh you know primarily dell does dell does really well but hpe does does well uh, as well for those wondering hey hpe and and carrier what the heck are you talking about um hpe is very very locked into the carrier market in fact in western europe they have a bunch of uh, essentially carrier as a service deals uh, at the at the core, and I think what what you're going to see HPE do is do a bunch more stuff uh, on on the edge. Uh, Aruba plays into this, and, and as far as I'm concerned, uh, from the network uh, and the carrier side, you've got HPE at at the core. Uh, you've got it uh, at at the RAN, and then on the implementation uh, with with uh, Aruba um, on the on the deep edge. So uh, you know, hopefully uh, you're you're all seeing. You know that uh, we weren't lying uh, up front uh, when we when we gave our what we expect on MWC 22. And the great part is we're seeing some of these announcements uh, before MWC. Yeah, wait, why are we going to MWC again, uh, uh, Daniel? 
if uh, if there's all these announcements now. Uh oh, you're on mute. So we can shake hands and <laughs> eat hummus. Um, no, you want right. to see so this sorry to person. sorry to, sorry to put you put you on the spot here, but um, yeah, I, I also wanted to give some props to uh, Dell Tech and uh, and Marvell that, quite frankly, have a very very similar partnership going on at the at at, at the same time. The big yeah. difference here between Qualcomm and Marvell is is Marvell owns RAM, right? Uh, it was kind of cool when uh, Marvel kind of uh, snuck out, uh, you know, the VRAN and, and ORAN stuff. I don't think people were were expecting it. I think they expected uh, Marvel to kind of stick to their stick to their guns and really lean into uh, what 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 they went at. Yeah, Marvel's been a real success story in so many different ways, and I know it didn't uh, end up on the topic because it's the six five, and we'd had these, and that would have made the seventh. But uh, yeah, there is a shout out. There's going to be a lot more of these kinds of partnerships, though. I think that is yeah. the way we can we can uh, describe this. You're seeing uh, chip makers, fabulous chip makers, infrastructure makers, and saying, "Hey, you know, we can if we're going to virtualize this thing, it's going to take a little bit of the best of all of us. It's going to take software. It's going to take hardware. It's going to take um, you know chips. Pat, you can't run this stuff on air. You know what I mean? So you got to have the you got to have the semi companies. I, I I got that from you. Thank you. Um, but, but thanks yeah. for the props, dude. You, you normally you give me no credit, but you did this time. Oh, I always give you credit. I know, buddy. I'm I almost always give you credit. And by the way, when I tweeted about Dell yesterday, I took your tweet and kind of just edited a little Thank bit. Thank you. So, Appreciate yeah, that. You know what? There's nothing wrong. You know, people put dumb titles on their LinkedIn, like growth hacker. That's that's actually growth hacking. Is how do you more efficiently get stuff done? Well, yeah. sometimes someone's already said the exact same thing you're trying to say. So you know the difference between reporting and analysis is, you know, I took the data, the report data, and I put my own analysis around it. And that's what you do, and that's what good analysts do. We don't need to we don't need to share the the, the earnings highlights because that's actually in the press release. We need to actually say what does this mean and why should anybody care? Anyways, going back to the HP Qualcomm five uh, G partnership. You know, I, I'll leave this to to I've, I've been uh, watching HPE's telco business. Um, you know, actually on both the Marvell piece and the HP piece, you'll see uh, future analyst Ron Westfall has actually wrote a research note on both. So if you want to dive deeper, I will give you a little bit more there. But um, you know, what we're seeing here is purpose built edge computing, um, and we're seeing it built with some best of breed technology through a partnership. And right now, if you're in five G, you really can't go wrong partnering with Qualcomm. You just can't. It's the it is where you want to be when it comes to connectivity. And so I, I really won't be surprised uh, kind of the way you saw Intel inside PCs to be seeing Qualcomm inside a lot of virtualization and open RAN technologies going forward. So maybe I'll be wrong, but I expect to be right. But a good, uh, good adder there. I didn't know you guys did a paper on that. Uh, congratulations. You write about everything. You're equal opportunity writing. I, I get that. I get that. I, I might even go read it. We'll see. Oh, maybe not. Um, hey, let's move into uh, the next topic. And Lenovo just had another uh, blow it out, uh, blow it out quarter here. Daniel, what's uh, what's going on? You know, we don't normally uh, we don't, we don't normally hit uh, Lenovo here, uh, but we probably should. I mean, they've had stellar performance for the last uh, few quarters. Yeah, I mean, the company's posting out record results. Uh, you know, they're very focused on their results being closely tied to digital. And actually, Pat, to their credit, this is another company that puts together a pretty thorough investor deck. Yes. Uh, did have the if chance you weren't going to gonna say it, I was going to. I would like to see, <laughs> I'd like to see the investment thesis slide. That's a nice one. I, I, absolutely. But I do like the fact that they're breaking it down. So so here's some some things just for a lot of people don't know because they probably think of Lenovo, you know, they might know of part of the business. So you might be familiar with the company for um, most likely PCs that used to be IBM's ThinkPads. That, that's, that is what older people probably remember. But this is a company that's highly diversified. It's got multiple businesses in intelligent devices. It's got businesses in data center and infrastructure. It's got... Um, a, a very complete set of, ser of service businesses. They have a consumption-based offering, uh, much like uh, GreenLake and Dell Apex that we do talk about quite frequently. And, and actually, Pat, what's been most impressive is very quietly, they've been consistently growing <laughs> at staggering rates. Yeah. And so we get to talk regularly, you and I, to Kirk Skagen, and Kirk's one of the top execs here in the US. Uh, he leads uh, you know, 
in the data centers, his big baby, uh, it, 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 he's the big baby, his big baby, <laughs> but he does talk to us about all this stuff. I mean, you're talking about a company that's seeing record income. Uh, you're seeing record revenue, uh, you know, 20.1 billion in the uh, most recent quarter. Uh, you're seeing growth in, in net income significant. You're talking about year over year, a 62% um, growth in, in the revenue. So you're seeing strength, uh, you know, the company's making significant investments, uh, R&D investments, they're expanding significantly. Pat, you and I have actually been involved in some of their launches like Edge, they had a recent Edge launch that was really significant. AI uh, technologies that is going into their, their business. Um, you know, they, they're very focused on sol solutions and service. Um, you know, they're, they're basically chasing what they call a, you know, um, a trillion dollar 2025 IT services business. And so they're continue to expand in that in that sector. So, you know, you basically have infrastructure, you've got services, and then you've got devices. And Pat, I would say, across the board, I mean, the company has done extremely well, you saw, uh, I believe their margins in devices up significantly year on year, something um, their operating profit jumped like 21%, which, as we know, in the uh, device space, that's hard to do. Devices are not like services, where in services, you can push margin. Um, you know, of course, ASPs have gone up a little bit with demand uh, and whatnot, Pat, but <coughs> excuse me, they've been able to to show growth across the board. So, you know, I think it's a combination of that. I mean, they are domiciled in China. I do think sometimes the company gets looked at a little bit differently, but their U.S. presence is very substantial here, Pat. They have uh, large headquarters here. They have lots of employees here. They have a go to market here um, and they work, uh, I would say, in a very strategic way between the two, uh, you know, between Lenovo here in the U.S. and China. They are very focused on meeting um, a number of what I would say uh, social impact kind of objectives. And they talked about that in their most recent earnings, um, especially in areas like uh, sustainable materials but not just for the greenwashing aspect of it, but what's been in impressive is they are looking at these things, they're addressing and acknowledging the needs for these things while using these things to create what they're kind of referring to as sustainable profitability in the business. And that's saying, hey, we wanna to continue to grow revenue, but we also want to uh, you know, make sure that we're profitable and we're delivering to shareholders. This is a stock, by the way, that doesn't move much. I mean, just being straightforward, it does not move much. Great results lesser results it seems to be kind of a steady eddy type of type of, of stock but you can't confuse that pat and everybody out there i know you wouldn't confuse that buddy but everyone out there can't confuse that for not having an impressive amount of growth when you're seeing record revenue and you're seeing incredible margin increases in businesses that are so hardware heavy you've got some people that are really operating and really got their their hands on the dials making some good decisions so it was a good quarter for lenovo um, and by the way, between Dell, Cisco's good quarter, um, and now uh, in Lenovo, I mean, infrastructure on-premise is back. This is not just cloud buying. So earlier on in the pandemic, we saw a lot of cloud buying. Now what you're actually starting to see is uh, data center, uh, enterprise data center buying. You're seeing branch office infrastructure buying. Um, and so I think that you're starting to see the growth come back because companies are going to bring people back to the office. By the way, Pat, last thought here. We need to have a talk about this. People are going to go back to the office. I'm increasingly convinced companies cannot do this remote thing forever. Um, there will be changes, but it's going to uh, we're going to see it spin back, which means there should be some good spending on the infrastructure to support that. Yeah. And listen, if they want to keep uh, Gen Z happy, uh, and different, uh, you know, they want to keep mentorship going. Uh, you know, you just can't do everything virtually. I, I never thought it was. I thought we were kidding ourselves. And I just need to go as far as my own kids and and see how they're reacting, uh, how they're reacting to this. But uh, yeah, let me let me weigh on this, kind of fill in uh, some of the things you didn't talk about, some of the things that really impressed me. So first off, uh, revenue by geo. <clears throat> Lenovo is uh, a, a Chinese company. Um, they're on the Hong Kong exchange, uh, which means I do uh, I do believe uh, in, in their books. But uh, if I were to ask you, hey, which region, uh, Daniel, do you think, uh, or anybody, what, where do you think they do the most business? You might say, well, they do the most business in China. We'd be wrong. In the fourth quarter, they did most of their business in the Americas. 30% of their businesses, business was in the Americas. 
Um, 27% was EMEA, 27% was in China, and 17% was in uh, was in South Asia. So they are they do most of their business in the Americas, which is just absolutely uh, amazing and, uh, and 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 impressive. The other thing I want to mention is if you didn't notice the first thing that they talked about. Uh, and you put things in the order of importance was SSG, uh, their services. Uh, yep. Lenovo is the only uh, infrastructure company that, that completely breaks down their services uh, like this down to the op inc level, which uh, to me is like, if you want to turn a ship, this is one of the ways that, that you do this. I was on the phone with uh, uh, Ken Wong, uh, president of SSG, uh, either yesterday or the day before, we had a really uh, a great uh, conversation on this. So not only do you put it first, uh, and it, which, by the way, is super risky because all the eyes are on you. And, oh, they didn't just hide it with a percentage increase. They put the number there, right? $1.5 billion uh, in, in, in Q2. Um, and, you know, with a 44% uh, improved year-on-year -year improvement uh, in, in the margin. Right. So I think it takes uh, it takes a lot of courage to do this. And I think, you know, Lenovo is trying to move the perception from a, a box pusher to a service provider. And, and I really appreciate the, the way that they're doing this. Uh, one comment in ISG, first time for profitability, which which is is important. Right. We saw a ton of revenue growth, a lot of hyperscale growth on the server side, a lot of storage growth uh, that we saw. And I know that that uh, Lenovo's competitors always like to denigrate uh, uh, what came out of ISG because, like, hey, uh, where where are the profits? Like, here we go. We we have we have uh, profits. The one thing that everybody needs to keep in mind is the profit model uh, of Lenovo. And by the way, this could be why maybe the stock hasn't moved much. Um, it you know could be because of that margin model, but they're in a position to take share. Because the expectations of their shareholders are a lot lower, and and where Lenovo started, which was in PCs, uh, anything in SSG and ISG actually makes the overall business and the margin profile uh, go up, and and that's what I see as a as a recipe for um, market share growth. Uh, IDG just keeps humming along, uh, while their growth wasn't as as high as as let's say uh, Dell, who had thirty percent growth. They did have sixteen percent growth, but their profit was uh, was 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 off the chain, right? Uh, Twenty one percent improvement in in uh, operating uh, operating profit. Um, and by the way, I, I'm not saying uh, I'm not doing the comparison to Dell to denigrate it. Uh, 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 Lenovo has a lot of consumer in there, which isn't taking off. Where on the other hand, uh, Dell is more focused on commercial. Quite frankly, you know, at Dell it had thirty percent growth in commercial, uh, which overall led to a twenty six percent growth in Dell, which just leads you to understand just how how big the commercial business is at Dell and how big the consumer business is uh, in in Lenovo. Uh, altogether, uh, a really a really good quarter. Uh, for them. And I'm, I'm really, you know, they're a company that uh, I, I have my eyes on um, and not just for uh, the, you know, the boxes that they have, but more along the lines of uh, services. Quietly and, 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 and consistently doing their thing, Pat. And so got to give credit. Yeah. Where to. yeah. So let's get into our last topic. And that is um, T-Mobile did an announcement uh, for, for, for IOT so uh, what a lot of people don't understand, well, first off, T-Mobile, I would say, uh, in the U.S. is recognized as a consumer play. What not a lot of people know is, though, is when they acquired Sprint, Sprint had a very robust uh, B2B play. And, and since the two companies have come together, uh, you've seen these superpowers uh, unite. Uh, you had some product, uh, product announcements uh, that were out there. Uh, that that I thought were 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 really cool. They have their own platform for collaboration uh, as well. They've done a partnership uh, on that one. But here's a an IoT announcement. And uh, if you if you stand back and and you say, well, wait a second, T-Mobile and IoT. Here's the thing: uh, when you're doing an international uh, IoT rollout, let's say it's it's global, and this 
in this uh, in this case, let's let's use Deutsche Telekom or Telekom as it's known because it's all throughout uh, uh, Western Europe. You typically have to piece part the access together. You can't just go to one vendor, uh, which gets super uh, complex. So you can imagine it's hard enough to get your solution going, right? You actually have to have the IoT devices, you have to have the IoT services, and you have to actually crank on the data to get some do something useful uh, with that with that IoT uh, application. But uh, uh, what what's happening is you can go to one customer and get service across 188 destinations, 383 different uh, networks uh, worldwide. You've got a single account team, you have a single bill. And uh, I, I think this is, is pretty awesome for uh, a, a multinational company uh, trying to do an, a, a global rollout of, of IoT. Yeah, absolutely, Pat. I mean, look, uh, it's a very interesting uh, participation to have T-Mobile, you know, jumping into the space. It's diversification, but we've seen this from the other vendors. They've all sort of been dabbling. Uh, we saw it from AT&T, seen it from Verizon. You know, I think um, T-Mobile has just been uniquely more successful at executing over the past few years, uh, and it's been visible in their growth and their results. Um, you know, the transition uh, from Legere has been okay. I was not sure how yeah. that would go. Um, it's actually gone quite well, and, and the company continues to innovate both on the business end and on the consumer end. Um, and of course, uh, I and full disclosure, customer, and we advise this company. But uh, it, I feel like every week, Pat, there's another announcement. There's something else interesting coming from T-Mobile that continues to fill in the portfolio. A lot of good partnerships um, on device side, but also, like I said, on the business and the business technology side. I think they're going to do very well. This is one more feather in the cap type of announcement. Of course, we got to see how it pans out. Uh, hear how you know how this is uh, adopted in the market and what kind of growth it gets. But uh, you know, big thumbs up. Um, and like I said, it's interesting, Pat, to see all these uh, announcements drop this week. I guess maybe there's a reason. Like there's an event going on that's really centric to carriers and 5G. But a whole lot of announcements, Pat. Uh, it feels like you said. We got a lot of the show before the show. And of course, you and I give us a lot of props because we've been pre-briefed on a lot of stuff that's going to happen this week. And I think we made it through this entire show without slipping on any embargoes. And that's risky to do the show live when you've been presented so much of what you know is going to come out. But, uh, you know, sign of experience, professionalism, or just dumb luck? Probably dumb luck here. But hey, uh, let's wrap up the show here, Daniel. This is a lot of fun. And uh, let me see, it's around, what, 5 o'clock, uh, 5 p.m. your time there, which means uh, you'll probably be going out to dinner in five hours at like 10, 10 p.m. So Yeah, about 10 is when we'll uh, we'll start getting ready for dinner. I love that. So, but hey. We only uh, woke up. We only woke up like 15 minutes ago. I know. That's terrible. That's terrible. <laughs> you know, the, the problem with MWC, it's like the worst of both worlds because you do the you do the Spanish night and then you, you do the German uh, meetings in the morning at like 8 a.m., right? Yes. So it's like it's like uh, it's like torture. So and what's, uh, yeah, worse, I, what's worse, if you want to really beat yourself up, is that your our real work stuff starts pouring in around three four p.m. in the afternoon. That's when like the all the emails start flowing in, yeah, and all the regular work. And so you end up from five until that ten o'clock dinner, you're actually still working because you end up going back to your your hotel and you're cranking out. The rest I'm of psyched work. to get there, buddy. But hey, I want to thank everybody for uh, tuning in here. Uh, Daniel is live from an undisclosed uh, location bunker. in, in Western bunker. Western it's Europe, where they uh, serve a lot of uh, ham and cheese and red wine. I'll be there in in two days to to join him. Uh, we're going to be doing a lot of uh, great uh, video work together, which I'm super excited about. But literally, uh, no, seriously, thanks for tuning in. Uh, we really appreciate this. And Daniel, thank you so much for, I mean, you literally just rolled in uh, off, off the plane and, and shout out. I really appreciate it. Yeah. Somehow, somehow I was the guy who was late uh, to, to this, not you. Uh, and I apologize for that, but uh, we, we try hard. So thanks for tuning in. Uh, hope you guys have a great weekend. With that, signing off. Sayonara. Have a good one.